antiarrhythmic medications to keep your AFib asleep. So there are multiple ways of treating the symptoms of atrial fibrillation. And one of the easiest ways is just to slow it down with a rate controlling medication. Those medicines just slow your AFib down, don't keep you from going in and out of it, but they try to slow it down so that you notice it less, can tolerate it better, and just, you know, go in and out, but, but make it so you feel better while in it and just tolerate it. That really only works best for the early stages when you're not constantly in AFib or the end stage when you're permanently in AFib and we can't get you out of it. But a lot of times it's just not good enough. A lot of times people say, okay, my AFib is starting to progress as I get older, because that's natural for your AFib to progress and start to wake up more and more. And when somebody's in AFib a lot more on a regular basis, when they're in it 40, 50, 60, 70% of the time, then they start to say, you know, those rate controlling medications are fine and they definitely slow it down where I feel better than if I wasn't on those medications. I definitely feel less palpitations, but I'm in it a lot more now and I'm still feeling lousy. I'm still feeling some palpitations and I'm starting to feel in just that tiredness of being in, in an abnormal rhythm that's making my heart go faster than normal. And I just poop out quicker, have more tiredness, shortness of breath, things like, things like that. So that's when they come and say, can you make it so I'm not in atrial fibrillation? Not just make it so I tolerate my AFib, but actually keep me in normal rhythm where I'm not actually constantly going in AFib. Can you keep me in normal rhythm? Because I think I'm gonna feel best to be completely back in normal rhythm. So the second way we have of treating atrial fibrillation would be to use an antiarrhythmic medication to keep the AFib asleep. So this is a class of drugs that like the name implies, it works against abnormal rhythms or arrhythmias. And so what it does is these drugs alter the electrical properties of the electrical cells in your heart, and they make certain abnormal cells like AFib less likely to wake up. Now, there's different strength levels. So we have five drugs that can do this at different strength levels. The strongest one can suppress the most AFib. The weakest strong one suppresses the least amount of AFib. And so what we do is we try to see what stage the person is at in terms of their AFib and then use an appropriate medication. Because let's say, for example, that somebody is in an early stage of atrial fibrillation and they're in it, you know, maybe 15, 20 percent of the time. They have episodes that are lasting you know, six to eight hours or, or a day and or two a day or two and they say look I'm, i don't want to just slow this down i want to not be an afib but i'm not ready for something invasive like uh, an ablation procedure can you use a drug to keep it asleep so i would look at the patient and say okay what stage of afib do i think this person is in how many walls do i think have these afib sources or triggers well they're obviously in an earlier stage they're not in it 50 60 70 percent of the time they're in it you know 10 percent 5 10 15 percent of the time they would be in that early stage paroxysmal, but even more so because that's just a gradation of, of a continuum of AFib. I mean, you'd say early, mid, late, but it's actually a continuum of disease. So you say, okay, well, I think this person has, you know, maybe one wall's worth of AFib and they're in it 10, 15% of the time because I believe that as a, a model of AFib that serves me better is to think about AFib as being how many walls worth of AFib do I think this person has? You know, how many sources of AFib, AFib triggers? If they have it on one wall, then I think they're going in and out of it, you know, five to 15%. If they have it on two walls out of the six, then they're in it 20, 30%. If they have it on three walls, they're in it 50, 60%. If they have it on four walls, they're in it 70, 80%. If they have it on five walls, they're in it 80, 90%. And if they have it on all six walls, that's when they're in AFib 100% and permanent. So I like to think about it that way instead of this arbitrary early middle late which i think is not precise enough so i think okay if i think this person's you know maybe got on a one wall they're at early stage early paroxysmal afib then am i going to use the strongest drug that i think can suppress maybe up to five walls worth of afib no that would be overkill that would be malpractice in my mind because then you're exposing that person to all the risks of the stronger drug before they need it Yes, it will keep the AFib asleep a lot longer than a weaker drug, but they can be exposed to more side effects and, and I just don't agree with that. So I would try to use a drug that's just strong enough to keep the AFib asleep. So if I choose the weakest drug that I think can suppress maybe one and a half to two walls worth of AFib and I think they have maybe one wall or half a wall, 
I put them on that, there's less likelihood of bad side effects long term, and they could do great for a number of years. But the medicine will not work forever. Because remember, the medicine's not getting rid of the AFib cells. It's not like you take it for a few years and it magically destroys the AFib cells and cures you. No, it's just keeping the AFib cells asleep until it can no longer keep the AFib cells asleep. And when might that happen? When the AFib has progressed to a point where it's you have more AFib cells than what that drug can adequately keep asleep. So once again, using the simple model of forest fires and how many walls, if you say, I think the person has half a wall or one wall's worth of AFib, they're in it 10, 15% of the time, and I put them on a drug that I think can suppress one and a half to two walls worth, then that should keep it asleep or 100% or mostly asleep for sometimes several years. But it will not work forever because not only does it not get rid of the AFib cells, there's just as many cells there, even with the drug, it's just keeping it asleep. And if they stop the drug, those cells are still gonna wake up just as much as before. But if every year the person gets older, they're potentially forming more AFib cells and it's growing stronger and progressing, then it's gonna work up until they have about one and a half to two walls worth of AFib cells. And then they're gonna break through a little bit, a little bit. And then finally, when they have two walls worth of AFib cells, it's gonna completely fail the drug. And then they're gonna be in AFib 20, 30% of the time. And they go, wait a minute, wait a minute. Three years ago, four years ago, when you first put me on that drug, I was only in AFib five to 10% of the time. Now I'm in at 20, 30% of the time. What gives? because they have progressed, they're at the next stage, that's why they're failing the drug. If their AFib wasn't progressing, they would never fail these drugs and we would just have cures on our hand, which obviously isn't how it works. So then you say, okay, well now you're in it more, you're at a more advanced stage, and then I put them on the next strongest drug, maybe the third strongest drug that can suppress you know, three out of the six walls, and it's gonna work great up until they have more than three walls worth and then they're breaking through. And now when it fails, they're in it 50, 60% of the time instead of 20, 30% of the time. Now, fast forward, they've got four and a half walls. They're in it 80% of the time. You put them on the strongest drug, which is the amiodarone drug. And that drug is a very strong drug. It's suppressed like five walls worth, but it has long-term side effects. If you're on it for more than five to seven years, it can damage your liver, your lungs, your eyes, and your thyroid. So we hopefully work your way up to it instead of just putting it on at an early stage, which is overkill and having them develop side effects later down the line, which I think is wrong. Um, if you put them on that and it keeps it asleep, great. But then when it finally, they have five and a half walls and they're in it 95 to 100% of the time and they fail that drug, that's when the AFib is virtually permanent. And that's where even an ablation isn't gonna be able to get rid of enough because it's not all or nothing. It's how much of the force fires can you put out? And so, but those person might say, hey, look, I got, 10, 15 years out of it. You know, I started with the weakest drug. I got three or four years out of that. Then went to the next drug, got three or four years out of that. And now I worked my up to the strongest drug, got four or five years out of that. And now my AFib is virtually permanent, but I'm in my eighties. I'm okay with that. Just slow me down with a rate controlling drug from this point forward. And I'm okay with it. This is not life-threatening and I have worse problems, but fine. But if somebody was only in their fifties or sixties, when this process started, and by the time it becomes permanent, they're only sixties to early seventies, they might go, eh, I'm not really ready for my AFib to become permanent at such a young age. I, uh, maybe I'll do something more. Maybe I will do the ablation and try to get rid of the cells and turn the clock back to an earlier state. So just know that these drugs won't work forever, but they are doing more than what the rate controlling drugs do. They're actually keeping the AFib asleep, but they also have potentially stronger side effects. The rate controlling drugs don't have any dangerous side effects. That's why non-cardiologists can prescribe them and that's not a problem. But only a cardiologist or an electrical cardiologist, like an electrophysiologist, should be prescribing antiarrhythmic drugs because these drugs, they actually alter the properties of the electrical cells and they make certain kinds of cells like AFib cells less likely to wake up, but they can also alter the properties of normal electrical cells and sometimes if you use them in people who have certain other comorbid medical conditions and you don't know what you're doing, they can alter the properties of normal electrical cells and sometimes cause those cells to become those dangerous rhythms, the ones that can wake up and make your heart go at three, 400 beats per minute and kill you in 20, 30 minutes. And so obviously you have to know what you're doing. These are not benign drugs, but if you know what you're doing and you use them in the proper individuals, they can be very safe. But you do have to know what you're doing. And remember, these drugs actually keep you in normal rhythm. So you feel completely normal in normal rhythm, but they don't get rid of the cells. They're just masking the cells until they can't mask it any longer. And they don't keep you from continuing to get older and forming more cells, so it will continue to progress. But when they work very well, they can work great and it can almost seem like your AFib is cured at least for a few years.